let's get started today. Uh, we're going to do two things today. One is we're going to look at a couple issues from the last assignment because these were pretty important and they're going to cause problems if we don't sort them out for all of these types of graph writing assignments. And then we'll do a new prompt. Uh, we'll work on pie charts today. Okay, so everyone's probably quite familiar with this graph at this point. And we can read this one over. This is a pretty good example of a description for this graph. It was written by Amy. The bar graph depicts the proportions of UK residents in five age groups who made charitable donations in two years, 1990 and 2010. That's the context, very good. In general, it can be clearly seen that the percentages of 18 to 50 year olds who gave to charity decreased, while the percentages of those 51 and older who made charitable contributions increased over the two given years. Okay, so all she's saying is, the percentages of these groups, the three youngest groups decreased, and the percentages of the two older groups increased. Remember, we don't know anything about how much money anyone gave. Okay. We don't know anything about the number of people in each category either. All we have are percentages. In 1990, so this is a very logical way to divide the information. Have one body paragraph about 1990 and another one about 2010. So in 1990, 42% of donors in the age group of 36 to 50 gave to charity, which constituted the highest percentage in the chart. So she's talking about this one here, 42%. This figure was two and a half times higher than the percentage of donors aged 18 to 25, which was 17%, the lowest percentage in the studied year. So this is a very good comparison. She's saying that this percentage is two and a half times this one. What we don't want to do on writing task one is just describe from left to right what we see in the graph. It's no good just to give a description. You have to have meaningful comparisons. This is an example of one. This was followed by 31% of people aged 26 to 35, should be a comma, which was the second lowest percentage among all demographic segments. And if you're stuck for vocabulary to describe any of these groups, use demographic segments. That's a really good one. The percentages of donors in the older age groups were higher, 35% of people aged 51 to 65, and 32% of those aged 65 and older made charitable donations. Moving to 2010, in 2010, there was an increase in donations among the two oldest groups of people, 51 to 65 and 65 and older. However, the percentages of donors among the three youngest groups decreased. It's a great introduction. 39% of people aged 51 to 65 donated, which showed a rise of four percentage points. Very important to use this kind of language, four percentage points not percent. Compared to the figures of the same age group in 1990, 35%. Also a rise from 32 to 35% of people aged 65 and older who made charitable contributions was noted in the chart. It's a good use of passive voice, was noted in the chart. It's another expression I would save and put in my back pocket because you need to show a variety of grammatical structures that you're comfortable using. So we've got, in the beginning, in general, it can be clearly seen. That's your passive voice. And if you want another example of passive, you can put this in pretty much anywhere. Use it once and you're good. You've got two examples of passive voice. In contrast, the percentage of donors in the three youngest categories decreased significantly. All right, that's a very good introductory sentence for the second half of the paragraph. It 
sets the context for the reader. It makes it very easy to understand. Again, that's your goal as a writer, is to make your work easy to understand for the reader, because the reader has no access to what's inside your mind. Right? People are very easily confused, so you have to be explicit, you have to be clear, you really have to pay attention to the structure, the ordering of your information. So you use these kinds of transition phrases, these kinds of introductory statements, use them abundantly because they really make it easier to read, to understand. So in contrast, the percentage of donors in the three youngest categories decreased significantly. Although the number of people donating to charity in the 36 to 50 age group was high, 35%, which was the second largest percentage among all demographic segments that year, so that's another meaningful comparison, it still showed a drop seven percentage points in 1990 to 42%. Similarly, among those aged 26 to 35, a decrease of seven percentage points from 31 in 1990 to 24% in 2010 was seen. Here we've got passive voice again. Lastly, the lowest proportion of people who made charitable donations was the youngest group, 18 to 25, which was 6%, 11 percentage points lower than 1990. Uh, okay, this, this last sentence is a little bit problematic. And this brings us to the second issue, which is the importance of the precision of language. So this is really well done. I would note only two things. In this, in this part here, I'd like to see more comparisons in terms of percentages. So as an example, the 18 to 25 group, it's pretty easy, even visually, it looks like it's roughly from 15 to five, uh, just as quick and dirty rounding. So this group dropped by how much? The 18 to 25 group, what, what's the percentage change between 1990 and 2010? 40, 50. Sorry? 30? Roughly 30? Well, e even if you look at it visually, well, nine, ten. well, the percentage point difference is from 17 to 6, right? So that's 11 percentage points. But, like, just visually, what does 2010 so look like? Yep. So, so we describe it like this, like we say uh, 18 to 25 year, uh, years age group decreased 11 percentage points in 2010. Let me give you a formula for this kind of sentence. There's, there's another thing we have to talk about, which is how to describe age groups. That was another huge source of, uh, of problems. Let's try and take one thing at a time. The percentage of donors among 18 to 25 year olds, that's what we're talking about. Yes, like decreased 11 uh, percentage points in, in 2010. Okay. Points. from 1990 to 2010, a drop of how much percent? We can be even more explicit from 17% more than uh, one uh, hundred. More than fifty percent. 
it is uh, 17 minus 7. It's right. like 10 or 11. And then this difference on 17. So the formula, once again, is find the difference between the two numbers. Yeah, and the difference on the divided on the first number by the first number. Divide the first number in your comparison by the difference. So in this case, we've got 17 minus 6 equals 11. So now we take 11 over 17. And OK, so 11 over 17 is tough. But I wouldn't do 17 minus 6 equals 11. I would round in a big, big way and use the words about or approximately or nearly. So instead of talking about 17 minus 6, I would just do 15 minus 10. Right, or sorry, sorry, 15 minus 5, right? So what's 10 over 15? How do we reduce this to the lowest possible denominator? One by two. Three? One by three? One over three, good. Uh, sorry, not one over three, two over three. Two over three, sorry, two over three. Okay, and what's the percentage? Sixty. We have to say that we have to mention a percentage at Robo seventy six percent. This is the comparison. This is a very important part of it. Because without something like this, you're just describing what's already there. That's, that's not, it says make comparisons where relevant. Right. So you need some kinds of comparisons and comparisons make more sense when they're in percentages, not percentage point differences. Like, do, do you remember the, the example of the two employees who are given the same raise? Right. If, if you don't have... Just, just as a simple example, it could be... You know, we, we've done this example before. Let's just do a different one. Product A, product B. Let's say the sales go from 1,000 to 1,500 units sold per month. And in product B, let's say we go from 2,000 to 2,500 units sold per month. So this one is plus 500 units per month. And this one is also, so if you just say that both increased by 500 units per month, that, that's not really helpful, right? It doesn't tell us anything. Like it tells us a little, but it's not useful for a comparison. So th what is the percentage increase for product A? 50%. Yes. And what about for product B? 
So this one is becoming more popular at a faster rate than this one. All right, as a sales manager, you'd be very interested in this. All right, you'd be much more excited about what's happening with product A than with product B. But if, if your analyst only tells you that both increased by 500 units per month, you, you don't have the information that the rate of increase is, is twice as much for product A. That this product is, maybe they've got great advertising or some kind of great promotion, but it's just flying off the shelves. And you're gonna have to devote more store space to this or get uh, faster supplies, whatever, whatever. Right. So that's a more meaningful comparison you'll get higher development score if you include information like this. They don't want to see just a straightforward description of what's here. There's no, there's no value added in that. So this sentence here that I've bolded is basically the formula. The percentage of donors among 18 to 25 year olds decreased 11 percentage points from 17 to 6% between 1990 and 2010. So that's the descriptive level. But then if you add this last part, a drop of 67%, now you're at the level of some kind of analysis. Right. And then you could even add which was the largest Drop. Yes, percentage decrease among all demographic segments. Any questions about this? So, uh, so it's not years old, year old. Okay, let's talk about how to describe age groups. Because so, I wrote years old. You use years old when you say she is five years old. She is. Let me put these together like this. Okay, she is five years old. All the kids at this party are five years old. These are the same, right? Whether it's one person, whether it's multiple people, if you're describing their age in this way, these people are all five years old. But if you say she is a five-year-old, okay, and you want to make it plural, you say there are 10 five-year-olds at this party. How many different ways can we describe the age groups here? Uh, this, this is Microsoft just being dumb.
The percentage of donors among 18 to 25 year olds decreased 11 percentage points. The percentage of donors among, what's another way we could describe this group? 18 to 25 age group. We have to change the preposition and the 18 to 25 age group. Good. Mm. How else? We can, we can say the percentage uh, of uh, donors aged. Uh, 18 to 25. Well, okay, how else? We can say a demographic segment or it, or it is like more than one, one group. 18 to 18 to 25 demographic segment, yep. Can we say with the 18 to 25 age group? No, in, in the no. group. In the group. Whose age? The percentage of donors? The percentage of donors, uh, sorry, one more time. Percentage of donors whose age? Whose Ages. Whose, or whose age? Whose age was 18 to 25? Hmm. Should we write by, decreased by 11% or? Yes, you can. You, yes, it, by or nothing, both are fine. Or who, where in the 18 to 25? Age category. Yeah. Whoops, so I'll put age because it's age group, age category, demographic segment. Any any other way? Or maybe we take the age group as subject among those, yeah. So you could say, this is a common way to do it. Among those, 18 to 25, among people, I don't like it because it's too obvious. We're not, if you were talking about like cats and dogs, you might put among cats, among dogs, but don't need it. Among those aged 18 to 25, Among those in the 18 to 25 age category? Yes. Among those in the 18 to 25 age group or age category or demographic segment. So I, I almost feel like we've talked about too many options here. But yeah, any of these will work. Got lots and lots of options. There's probably others that we're, that we're not thinking of, but this is most of them. The only problem I've got, John, is the percentage, um, the 67 percentage from the ratio. Uh, sorry, what's your question? Yeah, I had a problem of um, finding the percentage, like the 67 percentage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when I, when I was comparing the percentage point, I have no problem because it's the difference between the 18 and 25 in 1990 and, two, and 2010. Yes. But 
for the percentage, the 67 percent, I didn't find that, um, that it is, and I didn't know how to do it. Okay, so you want to round so that you have easy numbers. So if I see here, it goes from 17 to 6%. So it's 17% in 1990, it goes down to 6% in 2010. So 17 down to 6, those are not nice round numbers. What we can do is we can do 15 and 5, or we can do 18 and 6. Mm -hmm. okay. we, we massage the numbers a little bit to get nice round ones that divide evenly into each other. So we did 15 and 5, but if we do 18 and 6, it'll be the same result. So what's the relationship between 18 and 6? Uh, both can be divided by 2. Yep. So then you have 9 and 3. Yeah. And then if you have 9 and 3, those can still be made smaller. You can still divide both of those by the same number. Yeah. So, so 18 over 6 equals 9 over 3 equals... Uh, one third? Yeah, 3 over 1. One third. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the, so if something goes from 3 down to 1, let's say the price is $3, they're having some crazy sale, it's down to $1. What's the discount that they gave you? If they drop the price from three to one, how much is the discount? Um, 50%? 50 would mean that the price was cut in half. So three down to $1.50, that would be 50% off. 60, 60, I think. It's a little bit more than half. It would be 67%. It would be two thirds. Let's see. Three down to one, like that's three thirds, yeah? Yeah. Th think of three as three thirds. So you take away one third, take away two thirds. Yeah. Um, so if you divide three into thirds, it's one, one, and one. So three down to two dollars would be one third off, 33% off. Three down to one dollar would be two thirds off. Mm -hmm. So it would be 67% off. N I'm not sure if, uh, if that's making sense or not. No, still not. Okay. Uh, can you can you see my screen? Yes, I do. Yes, I can. Okay. Let's let's just walk through this one example one more time. So we're just looking at we're only going to look at this segment here, right? Yeah. Okay. So right now it's seventeen down to six. It's a little bit messy. Let's just call this eighteen, and let's just call this so six is fine. Uh huh. Right, so, as you said before, that is a 12 percentage point, point difference. Mm -hmm. Now, we want to know what that is in percentage, not percentage point. Mm -hmm. So, the formula is... So the formula for percentage difference has two steps. The first step is find the, just the absolute difference. Absolute, in math, absolute just means it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. Right, so going from four to seven or from seven to four, the difference is three. Right, we don't care. We don't care if it's minus three or plus three. That's just what we mean when we say absolute difference. 
So we need to find the absolute difference in this case between 18 and 6. Okay, because we're pretending it went from 18 to 6 over the studied period, right? Yeah. Okay, so what's the difference between 18 and 6? 2, 3, 2, Yeah, so that's 12. Yeah. We're just taking it step by step. So first you find the difference, you've got 12, and yeah. now divide the first number in your comparison. So we're, the first number in this case is going to be 18, not 6. Mm -hmm. By the difference. Okay, so that's 18 over... Twelve, yeah. Twelve, yeah. Okay, and what's eighteen over twelve? One fifth, one five, one point five. Mm. Mm hmm. Or what if we go in the opposite direction? What if we do twelve over eighteen? I think it's going to give you like 0 0.66, something like that. Sorry, we did it the wrong way. Divide the first number in your comparison, 18, by the difference. So it's 12 over 18. Made a mistake. Okay. So, sorry, 12 over 18 is? Uh, 6, six I think, 0 0.66. Yeah, 66.666%. 60, so we'll, we'll just round that to 67%. I see. All right, so 12 over 18 is the same as 2 over 3. Now I got it. Because you can divide 6 into both, right? So 12 divided by 6 is 2, 18 divided by 6 is 3, that's 2 thirds. Yeah. So it's a drop of 67% from... 1990 to 2010. Yeah. Yeah, now it's, it's clear. I can see you now, yeah. Okay. So it's just like uh, when your kids are learning math, we don't, we don't do a lot of this unless you're a shopkeeper or you're some kind of sales manager. Correct. You wouldn't be, you wouldn't be using this too much. But the math isn't very complicated. Like that's the extent of the math that you need to do, what I just showed you. It's a two-step formula. You do it a few times, it'll stay in your head forever. Okay. Just, just keep in mind that with these writing tasks, if you can't do it slowly, you'll never be able to do it quickly. So don't worry about the time, about how long it takes you to do these initially. Just do it properly. And then as with learning anything else, you'll get faster and faster with practice. It'll just become automatic. Okay. Just you have to keep reminding yourself to do these kinds of comparisons. And then once you do them a few times, it gets easy. Don't try and do super precise math. Don't rely on your calculator because you won't be allowed to use it on the examination. Just mm -hmm. round, just massage the numbers and then use the words approximately Roughly, nearly, slightly more than, slightly less than, and you'll be fine. Okay. John? Mm -hmm. um, so far, I'm okay with everything, but still stuck with the two-third. How did you get the two-third? Okay. So, 12 over 18. Okay. Which is... Uh, lowest common denominator, you can reduce it to two-thirds. So 12 over 18 is exactly the same as 2 over 3. So if you want the intermediate steps, like how do you go from 12 over 18 to 2 over 3? You have to find a number that goes into both if you want to keep reducing these. So which number can you divide into both 12 and 18? We can use 2 or 3. Okay, so if we have 12 over 18 and then divide both sides 
by 2, you'll get 6 over Three. 9. 9, sorry. Okay. If you divide both sides by 3, you'll get... Well, you can't. You can't because eight, 3 doesn't go nicely into 18. 18, yeah. Or, or sorry, sorry. Yes, it does. Okay. Uh, sorry, I've only had one cup of coffee. My apologies. Okay, so 12 divided by 3 is 4, and then 18 divided by 3 is... 9. No, no. <laughs> so you need more coffee, too. Yeah. Uh, 6. Yeah. Sorry. No sorries, no sorries. Uh, but those numbers in both cases can still be reduced further. Yeah. Like six over nine, for example, what number fits in nicely into both? Three. Okay. So how many times does three go into six? Uh, two. And then into nine? Three. So two thirds. That's, so that's two thirds. And if you end up with four over six, it's... Uh, two over yes. three. Same thing. You can still make it smaller. So it's two-thirds, and then two-thirds as a percentage equals? Um, around uh, 65%. Okay, so it's exactly 66.66666, et cetera, percent. Yeah. So, that's, that's, so round it to 67%. 66.6 rounds up to 67 Okay. Let's say we got a difference of 15 over 20. What would be the percentage difference? We can divide it on five, so it will be uh, three. Mm -hmm. Five, three, yeah, three, four. Mm -hmm. Four. Yep, three over four, and what's the percentage? Three over four, 75. There you go. When you do th this kind of rounding, for the most part, you're going to end up with a round number, with like a fairly straightforward percentage, like an increase of 25% or decrease of 25%. Uh, one-third increase or decrease, one-half increase or decrease, two-thirds, 75 percent, 100 percent, 200, 300 percent. You're not going to end up with numbers like it was a difference of 45 percent. It was a difference of 22 percent. That's not going to happen. You just need to round these. You need to massage these values these endpoints until you get a nice round number or a nice number that goes into itself like 18 over 6. All right, so like where it says 31 over here and then 24 over here, you know, that's not too nice. So you just change this one to 30. All right, so in this case, from, if it went from 30 to 24, what would be the percentage change or the fractional change? If you find it easy, easier to just talk about the fraction, like two-thirds, then go for that. You don't even need to do uh, any kind of real division. Just find the lowest common denominator. Okay. So if it changed from 30 to 24, what is the percentage or fraction difference? 10 over 9. Well, first we have to find the actual difference, right? Yeah. So equals 6. That's our first step. Okay. All right. First step, find the difference. So from 30 to 24 equals 6. And then, what's the second step? Uh, we divide 6 on 30. Good. Equals? Um, 0 0.2. 0 0.2. 1 by 5. 
105. You're, you're all trying too hard. Just what number goes nicely into both 6 and 30? 6. Is six. 6. Okay, yeah. so 6 goes into 6. 1 fifth. 1 by 6. Okay, so you can either you can either say it dropped by one fifth, or what is one fifth as a percentage? Twenty percent. Twenty percent. Twenty percent. So it decreased by twenty percent, or it decreased by a fifth. Okay. Right, and let's do just for fun one more example. So this one we've got it like let's call it forty-two. And let's call this one 35. Oh, beautiful. Okay, so it went from 42 to 35. Uh, so what does that equal? Seven. Seven. So that's seven percentage points, right? Seven. Not percent, but seven percentage <laughs> points. Now, we need to divide seven into... Yeah, 7 over 42. Good. And what does that give us? 1 over 6. 1 by 6. 1, yeah, 1 check. Okay, and if you feel like calculating that percentage, go for it, or just, or just leave it at 1 sixth. Leave it as one sixth. If you find yourself with a with a couple minutes of time at the end and you're bored, you can work out the percentage, right? Like on a piece of paper. But you can leave it by, at one sixth. You can leave this at one fifth. I mean, tw twenty percent is kind of easier to imagine for most people. So personally, I would always try and leave it as a percentage. But if this is the best that you can do, and that's the fastest, leave it as the fraction if you can't get to the percentage. But most of them are going to be easy calculations like this. Occasionally, you'll get one like this. Just leave it as one-sixth. Here, there is no percentage. No need to mention percentage. Well, the percentage is just the equivalent of this, right? So if, if you want to do the percentage, what is... 1 over 6. What would go into 100 six times? Fifteen. Uh, a little more. Sixteen. Sixteen point six. Yes. Mm -hmm. so sixteen I, point six 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 six. I should be honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I was hoping somebody would just cheat and take out a calculator. Okay. So yeah, just under seventeen percent. Okay. Or you can call it up roughly seventeen percent. Okay, so you can leave it as a sixth, and then if you've got a little bit of time at the end, you can do the math and figure it out. Okay. Any questions about the math part? Thank you. Everything is clear now. Okay. Clear as mud, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you have more questions about this, just feel free to 
feel free to ask. You can always do a couple sample questions for yourself, like a, so, a couple sample calculations. You can put them up in the in the Q and A forum, and I'm sure lots of people will be interested in a few more examples. Now, the next thing I want to get into is, in some of these cases, the 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 language needs to be really precise. So this sentence here is a bit problematic. It says the lowest proportion of people who made charitable donations was the youngest group. It's kind of awkward. Um, Maybe we can change it the other way around, like um, the youngest group people Go ahead. Who Go made ahead. charitable mm -hmm. donations were the lower proportion. Or the youngest group was the lowest proportion of charity people who made charity. Ch yeah, charitable donation. People where people who make charitable donations from professional line groups. Represent eighteen to twenty five age group. Say this is in uh, see, we can do slightly more complicated grammar, which is seventeen percent of whom donated in nineteen ninety. And six percent in And then we can say which was a drop of or you can say two thirds. Let's let's have a look at some other problematic ones. Um, Chomri's not here, but she's got a couple of these issues. Uh, the first paragraph is fine. To start with, let's go here. The donor percentage in 1990 increased by age category up to 50 before decreasing. Okay? The lowest percentage value also comes within the same range, which is 17% contribution by the age group of 1825. Um, I would just change this to among those 18 to 25. Okay. However, there is a nearly 50% increase in 26 to 35 year olds showing 31% in that same year. So there is a nearly 50% increase in 26 to 35 year olds. 
So this would be okay if you were talking about population increases. So there's a 50% increase in what? In donations among 26 to 35 year olds. Showing 31%. You can see at 31% in the same year. Uh, the highest donor percentage over the given period, not showed, but was seen. In the age category of 36 to 50, that's a little bit awkward. We want to say in the 36 to 50 age category. See, stuff like this too. The year 2010 showed a continuous increase in age groups up to age 65. That's not really what we're talking about. What, uh, what should this be? Donation percentages. Donor. And donors by age group. Continuous increase in percentage of donors by age group while showing a minimum contribution, while showing lower contributions. Or decreased contributions. The age category of 18 to 25 contributed 6%. That's not really accurate. What should this be? Decreased to six percent in two thousand ten. Well, this this doesn't really match the graph because we don't know what they contributed. This, it's not what we're talking about, right? Mm. The contributions of those aged 18 and 25 was 6%, for example. No, that's, that's the same thing. We don't know what their contributions were, what their individual contributions were, or what their contributions were. The percentage the of their percentage. Still no. Percentage of donors. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. This, is, this is the percentage of people in each of these five categories who donated money to charity. We don't know anything about how many people, about what, uh, how much money they gave, nothing like that. Just the percent of the total in each group which gave money to charity. 1990, 18% of 18 to 25 year olds gave to charity, which dropped to 6% in 2010. So in this one down here, it would be more like 6% in the 18 to 25 age category contributed to charity. 6% in the 18 to 25 age category contributed to charity. 
which was a one-third contribution. So we don't know what the total is, so you can't call it a one-third contribution. To be really precise, you have to use language like this, which was a two-third drop in the proportion of donors. Does that make sense? It was a two-thirds drop in the proportion of donors. That's the only thing we know. So rearrange just a few. 2010, right? Yeah. The proportion. Because it's understood, there's only two years, so you don't need to keep saying in the studied period, in the studied period, between 1990 and 2010, between 19, you don't need to keep repeating it because there's only two years in this case. And then the subsequent two age groups of 26 to 35 and 350 showed a decrease in contribution by one quarter followed by one sixth. See, there's, there's no like logical continuous connection between these groups. They're completely separate groups. So it's not that one is followed by another one. So just and by one sixth. Just gonna get rid of this. So just to Let's just get rid of that, and I think we're okay. All right, Seth is not here. Last one we're going to look at, Allah. So there's a lack of percentage comparisons. First paragraph was good. Yeah, you use all. Yeah, followed by 51 to 65 year olds, right? Okay. The group is Okay, is it clear why this one is a fragment? Yes, because of the dot. Yeah, this has to be a comma. Yeah. So that tiny little punctuation issue is going to murder you. Okay. Okay. Well, and then you'll never put a comma after a while. I don't want to say never, but for the most part, no. Yeah, Bef uh, before a while. Before a while is okay, but not after. There are situations, yes, if you embedded a phrase or a clause inside the subordinate clause, you could, uh, you would need to use commas, but that's really sophisticated stuff, and that's not what's happening here. Okay. okay. So same thing here was seen in 51 to 65 year olds. Exactly the same thing. 51 to 65 year olds. Percent among. Okay, you can say there's two ways to do this. In those age 26 to 35 category. In if you want to keep category, what do you have to change? Aged. What should we delete? We got to delete two things. We got to add one thing. Uh, we can say a 24% uh, and, and, and those age, and those 26 to 35 age category. In no. Okay. 
Yeah, so this one is going to be the. Yeah, in the 26 to 35 age category. Not age. You can put age in the 26 to 30. Oh, no, no, she's right. In the 26 to 35 age, no, in the 26 to 35 year old category or just in the 26 to 35 category. Now, if you want to keep in those aged, then you do not put category. Because those aged, 26 to 35, that's the name of the category. That's already very specific. If we want to keep category, then that's the name of the category. Yeah, and And we want, uh, sorry, and instead of in, you want to see among those age 26 to 35, or it's in the category, like so. If anyone has any questions about the names of age groups or how to do any of this math, Please, please, please put your questions in the Q&A forum throughout the week between classes. This, these are, as long as I've been doing this, these are consistent problems. It's, it's these little things. And especially since a lot of you are, are doctors, this is going to be language that you're using on a regular basis. Right? If you're, even right now, everyone's talking about COVID and the kind of risks associated with different age groups. Yes, yes. Right? The highest level of risk is among those aged 65 plus. Okay, so again, we're looking at the charts below show the share of Canadian students at a Canadian university who spoke other languages besides English in 2011 and 2016. And we've got the 2011 data on the left side and the 2016 data on the right side. Uh, is that big enough? Can you see it? Yes, yes, it's wet enough. All right, great. It's great, thank you. Hopefully this one's a lot simpler than some of the others we've been looking at. The numbers are really easy. They're nice round numbers on both sides. Okay, so just tell me what you notice. The Punjabi only student, the number of the Punjabi only students uh, are increasing in 2016, mm -hmm. like 50, about 50%. 50 By how much percent? 50% because it was 10 before and now it is uh, 20 almost double 100 percent sorry not 50 it's 100 percent that's right 100 percent difference and oh. the french is 15 percent if you look at the french mm -hmm. so it's a 50 percent increase in french speaking students that's it. 2016. That, and then mandarin there's no change yes what yeah. about those speaking no other language it is actually decreased. Mm -hmm. Decreased by five percentage point. Right, which is, and in this case, it's going to be five over thirty-five. Yep. Five over thirty-five. And five over thirty-five as a fraction is how much? One over seven. One over seven. One over seven. So it decreased by one seventh. You can say. Uh, how about the percentage of people speaking another language that's not French, Mandarin, or Punjabi? It is also decreased by five percentage point. Yeah, so how much percent? Mm. One fourth. That's it. And what about those speaking two other languages? 
Also decrease by five percentage points. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that five percentage points represents what percentage decrease? Five over fifteen. Right. So this is similar to the last one that we saw. So it's five over fifteen, which is one third. One third, or thirty-three percent. Thirty-three point three three three. If you want to be super specific. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you another question. What percentage of students spoke a language or also spoke a language other than English in 2011? Sorry, can you repeat the question? What languages? What, what percentage of students spoke at least one language other than English? Uh, that's just the reverse of the first statistic. It says no other language, 35%. So what did the other five categories add up to? 65%. 65. So 65 spoke at least one language other than English. And in 2010, that went up to... Seventy. Seventy percent. That's just the reverse of this first point here about no other language. How would you divide up this information? How would you order it? Two zero one one and two zero sixteen. Yep, that's the easy way to do it. What would you say in your general overview? Sorry, I can didn't hear. How you divide it depends on which one increased, which one decreased, or you could, or just do it by year. Hmm. In the general view, you can say like uh, in 2011, uh, number of other than language, no other Eng uh, no other language um, decreased, but the others increased. Uh, the pie chart, chart illustrates the proportion of the university student in Canada who spoke other languages other than English. Mm -hmm. Near 2011 and 2016. Yes, but we need to know in the general overview, like right now that's yes. just the, the header. What, what is the yes. big yes. pattern yes. that you notice? This is the header. Um, maybe Mandarin only. It's doubled in uh, 2016. It's remained same. 10 to 20. Mandarin no, stayed the same. same language. 10 to 10. Oh. Punjabi uh, is English. Sorry, Punjabi only. No other language uh, decreased over the given period. And uh, other languages increased. I think during the given period, one language decreased, and I think four increased, mm -hmm. and one remained the same. So, for me, if I like take it uh, the two years together, like no other language decreased, even they are. Uh, they are uh, accounted for the highest share for both years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we can write 
that it like uh, generally speaking it is clearly seen that a punjabi language is increase almost um, 100% almost uh, double the don't just avoid the specific percentages in your general overview okay because then you won't have anything to talk about in the body paragraphs so the general overview ideally doesn't have specific percentages so almost double you can say the punjabi speaking is almost double yeah. i think you're getting a bit too specific for the general overview okay. i would just i would just indicate which ones went up which ones went down and which one stayed the same so punjabi is going up isn't it so punjabi and french went up yeah. did mandarin stayed the same yeah. and then another language two other languages went down three three other three. languages yeah three three groups no other language another language and two other languages yes and and another language mm -hmm. the orange or blue the, the first three yes yes no other language mm. another language and two other languages all went down french went up punjabi went up mandarin stayed the same So this one, can we put it in one group and the rest of the two increased and one remained the same? We put it in one group. Yeah, I would do that for the general overview, uh, but then I would organize my work by year. I would describe 2011 in one paragraph, and then I would describe the changes to 2016 in the second body paragraph. So... Hmm. I think that would be easiest. And then I would start with um, just that kind of organization, maybe the same order as the general overview, maybe the ones that went up, the ones that went down, yeah, and then for unchanged. The, hmm. for the second, for, so for the first body paragraph, 2011, you describe this one, but still you need to do comparison. So maybe we can say this one the highest or mm -hmm. among 2011. Yes. John, uh, I've got a question here. Mm -hmm. In the context, um, when we paraphrase or paraphrase the chart, how we call the chart? Because it's not a graph. Graph and chart are the same thing. I see. You, you can be more specific. You can say the pie charts. The two pie charts show. Pie charts, the, okay. The two, the two pie charts illustrate. Okay. All right, so why don't you write your first paragraph? Paraphrase the context and write your general overview. Okay, and I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Let's say five minutes. Okay, the two pie charts compare the proportions of students who are Canadian citizens and enrolled in a Canadian university that were able to speak an extra language besides English. Uh, See, so it doesn't say Canadian students. Uh, sorry, it doesn't say Canadian citizens, right? So that's mm. a little bit different. Mm. Have, okay. Can we just say, let's just do Canadian students. Yeah, but it will be the same like the question. Portion of... Okay, I think we cannot... I would say the proportion of Canadian students studying at a Canadian university. Canadian students enrolled in a Canadian university, no problem. Or they, they look at this holistically. So you do it, you're, it really starts to get awkward if you try and make too many changes with this. So 
do the best you can. They do look at this holistically. So if a few words are the same, it's not going to kill you. Enrolled in a Canadian university that were able to speak an extra language beside English in the years 2011 and 2016. Besides English. Overall, it can be clearly seen. Good that the share of people speaking no other language, another language, and two other languages. Uh oh. Decreased. Well, while the percentage of those percentage, share proportion We have to repeat, it will be not clear that we mean the share because the first sentence. Mm -hmm. With statistics, the devil is in the details. Tiny changes make big differences in terms of like non-parallel comparisons, not talking about precisely what the graph shows. I would be super explicit for writing task one. Good. This one's good. The graphs illustrate the percentages at a Canadian university who spoke other languages beside, besides English. Clearly seeing that this year is another. The shares, okay, it would make sense because you're starting off with another, two other, and no other languages. So the first language you mention is another. So the reader's gonna be confused. So this screws up the, just the flow of information that you're transmitting to your reader. For that reason, it would make sense to mention the specific other languages first, and then it'll make sense why you're referring to another, two other, no other. But like I'm saying, curious week can be seen that uh, the share of the shares of another, like how you want me to say it. Right, but the, the reader has mm. no idea what another refers to. Oh yeah. right, because that's the very first one you're mentioning. So I would mention Punjabi, French, and Mandarin first just earlier in generally speaking, and then end with another, two other, no other. Okay. Does that make sense that? The... Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, here, Mr. Yaman, they said Punjabi only. What does it mean? They speak beside English Punjabi? Yes, only, only? one other language. Hmm. Yeah, and all those students speak English. This yes. Is, and there is, what is an extra? Uh, another language that means not Punjabi, Mandarin, or French. Yes, yes, okay. Uh, okay, so that, uh, that's why better to put Punjabi and put the specific ones first and then put the because you've got no other, another, two other. That doesn't mean anything until the reader understands which ones are specific that you're talking about. 
it it never makes sense to start by mentioning the other category. Okay. All right, Dr. Lodi, this it doesn't make sense to start with this. Yeah, I didn't put it here. Oh. Yeah, that's no, no, it's not here, sir. It is by mistake. I did it oh. the, after that. Uh, okay, the two. Yeah. Let me yeah. See. You can delete it. It's right underneath. You can delete the first part. The two pie charts? Okay. No, no, no. it is divided into two, six, six different groups. Yeah, this one. You highlight it. Yeah. Delete that one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Portion of university students in Canada. We have to add Canadian. The reason we have to add Canadian, Canadian yeah. is because they're not talking about foreign students. Yeah. Right, so it's that's a very important piece of information. Canada, who spoke other languages beside besides English. People will say besides English, what do you speak? Urdu. All right, so it's not beside, it's beside is like physically next to you. My friend is sitting beside me. But if you mean other than, uh, like if someone's preparing for a party, you'd say besides hamburgers, what are you cooking? Yeah. Besides ice cream, what kind of dessert did you get? Uh, other languages besides English in the years 2011 and 2016, what is it? The proportion of the students, the spoken languages. See, the, the, the spoken the languages It is divided into six different categories. What is it? The chart. The proportion of the students. The proportion of the students were divided into six different categories. Them. It's it's getting really awkward. Be careful with <clears throat> pronouns. In this kind of situation, if it's not clear what the pronoun refers to, you're getting an automatic six on coherence and cohesion. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's pretty much an automatic drop of one band score. Because this is considered a serious issue. Because when I read this, I legitimately have no idea what this what it refers to. Because there's nothing like this is the very beginning of your work, and there's nothing in here that tells me what it means. Okay. So, so Kennedy, uh, Kennedy University students were divided into six different categories. Yes, and and that's plural, right? These students are divided into six categories based on spoken language. Okay, good. Generally speaking, it is clearly seen, clearly seen, no comma here, that more than one third of university students only spoke English in both given years. That's not true because in 2016, it's under one third. 30% is less than one third. Okay. Almost, if I write almost one third? Then Say roughly. Roughly one third. Say not more, not less, just roughly one third of university students only spoke English. Whereas, whereas is one word. You got to put those together. Punjabi spoken were increased. Huh? Whereas Punjabi spoken were increased. 
What should this be? Let's go for students one, please. You could say, whereas Punjabi speakers, uh, whereas it's not that Punjabi speakers increased, the number of Punjabi speakers or the proportion, even better, because we, we also don't know anything about the numbers. So number and proportion are like kind of synonyms, but they mean different things in different contexts. And especially with statistics, you can't interchange those necessarily. Because it's possible that in 2016, we had fewer total students in university. It's possible that we had far more students in 2016. So again, we know nothing about the number of students. Whereas the proportion of Punjabi speakers were increased, the proportion of Punjabi speakers increased in number, in number increased. Well, you don't need to put number because you've got the proportion now. Yeah. Whereas the proportion of Punjabi speakers increased from 2011 to 2016. I'm not crazy about this one because you're mentioning one specific group mm -hmm. and this doesn't really give me a good idea of what you're gonna talk about in the body. If I delete it in the last line, should it be okay? Considering the first line, uh, like generally speaking, it's clearly seen that more than one third of the university students only speak English in both given years. It will be good. If it's I not. No, it's it's not enough. Okay. Let me show you. Let me show you something, because what you have to include is actually in the rubric. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the public rubric published by IELTS. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you see in band eight here? Yeah, it's, it's very, could you please zoom it? Yeah. It's very small. Presents, it's highlights, so that's in the body paragraphs, right? But yeah. then here, uh, sorry, the band seven criterion for the, for the general overview, as it says, a clear overview of the main trends, differences, or stages. So if you only give one trend, that's not main trends, differences, or stages. Okay. If you don't include that information, this is the way IELTS marking works. Let's say, uh, where's my annotation? There we go. The way they use this rubric is that, let's say you satisfy this criterion. Mm -hmm. um, let's say you clearly present and highlight the key features, but then your general overview um, is this. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't include the main trends, differences, or stages. It just has some appropriate information, but not enough. So you're, you're good on this point, you're good on this point, but then you also satisfy this lower criterion. They're going to give you this one. You're going to get a six, not a seven. Even though you might satisfy more criteria in the seven category, they're going to give you the band score corresponding to the lowest descriptor that you get. Okay, the reason they do this is probably so that the examiner doesn't have to waste time thinking about 
whether or not you deserve a seven or a six because your writing corresponds to criteria in both categories. So if you have any criterion in a lower category, that's the score you get. Life ain't fair, I know. Then what should I write? <laughs> because I was thinking generally it is. Yeah, so we'll we'll get to that in just a second. I'll give you I'll give you an example. Um, okay, Shireen. We just want the first paragraph. Okay. Are you there, Shireen? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Pie chart illustrates the proportion of Canadian students at a Canadian university who are bilingual, speaking English and another language and another in two specific years. Okay, we don't need in two specific years, just in 2011 and 2016. I like this. She interpreted this as who are bilingual. And it's not, so, and another language doesn't quite capture all the categories. If we add two small words here, it becomes more precise, right? And at least, okay, another language, okay. Because one of the categories is two languages other than English. And uh, Mr. Rian, there is one category, there is no other language. So how we can say bilingual? In the first line. Because, are bilingual. because the purpose of the chart is to show how many bilingual speakers there are, or trilingual. It says the charts below show the share of Canadian students at a Canadian university who spoke other languages besides English. It doesn't say who including those who didn't speak any okay. other languages. So it's just for, that, per, that percentage of no other languages has to be there for all the other ones to make any sense. Okay, uh, if we say bilingual, which means only two languages, but there is one group, two other languages, so they will speak three languages. That's right. Hmm. I think. Or bilingual or trilingual. Yeah. We could put yeah. that. Or we could just say, who spoke who spoke English and at least another language in 2011 and 2016 generally speaking be clearly seen that the percentage of Canadian students who spoke it has to be in past tense because the graph the data ends in 2016. Who spoke Punjabi? Other language. Other language went down from 20 to 15. Speaking those who spoke Punjabi and French. The percentage of Canadian students who spoke Punjabi and French increased. Good while if we want to simplify you could do this while most other categories decreased and then you could leave however mandarin only remained the same Okay, so that works as well. Okay, let's have a look at a model response for this. Shireen, can I get you to read it for us? 
Let me just blow it up a little bit. Okay, read. Mm -hmm. Okay, the pie, uh, the pie chart uh, show, the pie chart, the two pie charts show the proportion of Canadian students studying at a Canadian university who used one or more languages or other than, other than English, including French, Mandarin, Punjabi, in the years 2011 and 2016. Okay, read this paragraph or the second one, sorry. Yeah, keep going, keep going. Okay, generally speaking, it can be clearly seen that the percentage of French and uh, Punjabi speakers increased while the share of those uh, who spoke other languages to other languages and no other language decreased. Mandarin use remained unchanged. In 2011, the percentage of Canadian students at one particular university who could speak a language other than English was 65%. Okay, so that's, that's how this one starts off. The body paragraph starts with a general statement, and it's just the reverse of no other language. Because the graph focuses not on those who don't speak any other language. It focuses on people who do know other languages. That's the purpose of the graph. So I just flip that around from 35 to 65. Okay. Okay. Uh, the top three, lang three languages, French, Mandarin, and Punjabi, were each spoken by 10% of students. 20% of students spoke another language, while 15% uh, of students spoke two languages in addition to English. The single largest category through so, uh, so though, sorry, though was students who only spoke English at 35 percent. Mm -hmm. In 2016, the percentage of Canadian students who could speak another language that wasn't English increased slightly to 70 percent. And sorry, just to interrupt you for a sec. Notice how this is parallel to this one. This kind of parallel construction makes things a lot easier for the reader. It makes it a lot easier to see, uh, to compare the information in both paragraphs. Okay, go ahead. While the percentage of those who spoke only Mandarin in addition to English stayed the same, the proportion of those who could also speak French rose to 15, an increase of 50% over 2011. So that's As that formula that I was telling you about. So the meaningful comparisons are mainly in the second body paragraph, because then we can look at the second year in comparison to the first year. A couple people did this previously, where they did these kinds of comparisons, but for the earlier year. That doesn't make a lot of sense to travel back in time in that kind of comparison, uh, or travel forwards in time, rather, in that kind of comparison. Comparisons make more sense going back in time, where you're talking about the current situation and how it differs from the previous situation. It wouldn't make sense to talk about 2011 and how it differs from 2016. I mean, I, I can think of a couple situations where you might want to do that, but not on IELTS. Okay. Go ahead. At the same time, the percentage of those who could also speak Punjabi rose from 10% to 20, a jump of 100%. Uh, the percentage of students speaking a language different from those listed above fell from 20% to 15%, a, de a decrease of a quarter, while those who could speak two other languages dropped from 15% to 10%, a decrease of one third. Finally, the share of those who could not speak uh, a second language fell from 35% to 30% over the given period, uh, representing a, decre a decrease of, uh, of about 15%. Okay. Any questions? I have a question for the third paragraph. Mm -hmm. uh, why do we use uh, a period before while? A comma? Uh, no, 70% period while the percentage of those who spoke. Okay. While has two meanings. It means at the same time, like while I'm eating dinner, I don't answer the phone. Okay. 
It also means even though. Okay. Right? It, it's a synonym for even though or although. So although the percentage of those who spoke only Mandarin in addition to English stayed the same, the proportion of these others increased to da 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 no, the question is what, uh, why we didn't keep it as a um, uh, one sentence, why we put period. Mm. Mr. Okay. Yanshi meant why yeah, the sentence start while, uh, with while. Maybe she thought this while is supposed to be the middle one, but it depends on the sentence itself. This is the independent clause. while starts a subordinate clause. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so for this sentence, uh, I th think I know what you're talking about. Let's just shorten this one a little bit. Shorten this a little bit. And then... Oops. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's it's completely your choice if you want to put to switch the, independent and dependent clauses. It can go either can be at any point. Okay. And you need to show variation. You don't want to start every sentence with the independent clause. You want to vary between starting with the dependent, starting with the independent. You can put the independent in the middle. Like you could, a, a common sentence construction is to start with a dependent clause, put the independent clause in the middle, put an, maybe another relative clause at the end. So they're, they're looking for a variety of sentence structures. Can we add in, um, when we finish 50%, about 50%, in, uh, in other words, comma, while the presenting of those. Um, uh, when we finish, uh, the, finally, the share of those who could not speak a second language, yeah, after mm -hmm. about 50%, the next paragraph, can we add on the other hand, or in one word, Uh -huh. and then explain why the presenting of those who spoke only Mandarin. Because it seems for me a conclusion. I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. I'm yeah, not sure what so you want to do. Do we have to add a conclusion at the end? Never. You don't put a conclusion. For writing task one, this is not an essay, this is just a description. Yeah. Don't, don't put a conclusion. It's a very short task, and in the rubric, there is no mention of a conclusion. Mm -hmm. I see. So don't... Nonfiction writing begins with the conclusion. Okay. That's essays start with the thesis statement, and a thesis statement is basically your conclusion. Okay. Um, reports also begin with a conclusion. People want to know the key information immediately, and then the rest of the report goes into detail to explain why you came up with that conclusion, which you gave at the very beginning. It's, it's completely backwards from storytelling. Yeah. Okay. It's a conclusion they have given in the first paragraph, isn't it? All, all nonfiction writing, essays, reports, uh, like letters, even if you're, if you're doing the, the general response, you're giving the point of your communication at the very beginning. People want to know immediately why you're showing them this info, what your point is, what you want to get across. So you're starting with the conclusion. A thesis statement is your conclusion. In my opinion, this is a better idea because A and B. That's your conclusion. 
general overview, what is the main point of the chart? That's your conclusion. It starts at the beginning. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there's, there's no surprises. Uh, I'm probably gonna repeat this another few hundred times, but your goal is to make this as clear as possible for the reader, not for yourself. A good way to evaluate your own work is like, let's say you wrote this. Just put away the chart for a second so you can't see it. You can either do this yourself. It's probably better if you give this to someone else. Ask them to read this and draw the chart without ever seeing the chart first. If they cannot reproduce this kind of chart just based on your description, then it means your description isn't very clear. Yeah, I might be a little bit biased because I wrote this one, but when I read a paragraph like this, it to me it's crystal clear what percentage of students are in each category. And then in the next one, what changes took place between 2011 and 2016. Right. Again, I'm not writing this for myself, I'm writing this for someone who's never seen this before. All right, so uh, why don't we end here? I'll post the assignment location in just a moment. It'll be in unit 12 though. It'll be 12.2a.1. I can uh, put the URL, I can give you the URL right now. Last thing, now that you've got this, you've got this model here, what are you going to do with it? This is what I would do if you're struggling with these, and I know a lot of you are. I would rewrite this by hand. Yeah. Ideally, pen and paper. Next, when you're comfortable with that, I would transform this text into a point form summary. And I'll create one for you and I'll post it, but you can also do this yourself. And what that just means is get rid of all the structural language and all the grammar and just leave a point form summary of the ideas in each, in each of these paragraphs. Write your own version based on the point form summary Compare it to the original. Okay, and then I'll check it. Or an even better process would be write your own version based on the point form summary, compare it to the original and critique it yourself. Put everything away all of your notes so that you can't see anything. So just to go through this again. You've got this model response, copy it out by hand, maybe once, maybe twice, maybe three times if you need to. 
the act of writing it out will help you to internalize it. It becomes like your own. And the fact that you're, you read it out loud, you're using your mouth, you can hear yourself speaking, you're using your ears, you're using your eyes, you're thinking, you're also, uh, there's also a tactile component because you're touching a pencil and you're writing it out. So there's like a, a, there's like a hand brain connection. Do that at least once. When you're done, transform this into a point form outline and then write your own version based on the point form summary. And you can compare it to the original because they should be fairly close. There's lots of different ways you could describe these different components and we've talked about those during class. So you can do your best to critique your own version. Uh, but then, a good test of yourself is to put everything away so you can't see your notes, you can't see your outline, and then simply looking at the chart, write it again. So this is your third time at least writing it. Okay, and that's the version that I'll check. There's a lot of this you can do on your own. It's, our, our time together is quite limited, so this is a very powerful technique for learning to write on your own. This is how a lot of authors learn how to write. Some combination of those techniques that we just talked about. Okay, and this will be due Monday by noon and the revision will be due Tuesday by noon. Okay, thank you, John. Okay, my pleasure. Have a, nice have, a, have a wonderful weekend too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.